Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast, and I want to welcome Miss Laura Gasner Otting to the Unimpressed Podcast today. And she recently wrote a book called The Wonder Hell, and it's all about passion and what's passionate to you. So welcome, Laura. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, John. Thinking about this, and you know, I learned things through my own journey. When did this start? You know, this narrative that you're putting out to the world, when did this start resonating with you personally? Yes. Yeah, so I spent 20 years in executive search. And as an executive recruiter, I was paid by my clients to call the most successful people in the world, right? My clients hired me so I could go out and find them and recruit them away on their behalf. And so it was my job to call people with like bold face names and bold face companies because they were super successful. That's why I was calling them. But despite all this success, they weren't very happy, which is why they were calling me back. And I became fascinated about about this idea of why doesn't success equal happiness. And so I spent 20 years in executive search and eventually sold my company to the women who helped me build it. And I started thinking more about this question. And what I realized, thinking about the handful of people who I couldn't recruit away, and also my own life, the things that I did uh, you know, when I left jobs or when I decided to start something new, it was all not because I was not successful. It was because even though I'd filled all the boxes, I was filling the boxes on somebody else's path, somebody else's definition of success. And it wasn't until I realized that all the boxes were full, but I was empty, that I decided that there was probably a better way to do it. And so my first book, Limitless, actually talks about how to find that definition of success that works for us. And then Wonder How sort of came about from what I learned when I realized that after we do pursue a definition of success that matters to us, actually the stakes get even higher because suddenly we actually really care even more about the outcome. I kind of have a theory about that. I think that we're somewhat programmed in school. And I've been having this conversation a lot about how people are educated. And if you think about it in school, when let's say we're preparing, for, you know, a student is preparing for a test. And I think kids have gotten a pattern because everybody's trying to hit a grade, hit a number, and they prepare for a test and they memorize what they need to, to hit that number and they don't really treasure the information. And I think that's kind of, you're kind of seeing that play out in society in a way because nobody ever treasures anything that they're reading or looking into. That makes sense? Yeah. And not only do we not treasure it, we're not even present for it. I mean, I know when I was in high school, I remember thinking, well, I just need to get an 89 on this test to maintain my A average. So I'm not going to work as hard as I need to. And I'm just going to memorize these things. And then I would spit out the information and I wouldn't remember it. Like, I don't know what the teapot dome scandal is. I don't remember Pythagorean's theory. Like, I don't know anything. I knew stuff at one point long enough to like spit it out on the test, but I didn't understand it. And I do think you're right. I mean, I think if we're like training kids to like chase a grade or chase a gold star, then what are we saying? We're saying being a doctor, being a lawyer, making a lot of money, like these are the gold star jobs. And we're not actually allowing kids to figure out who they are and what they want to be. So like at some point, you probably had this experience, John, that a career counselor, a high school counselor, somebody said, pick a job, pick a trade, pick a career, pick a major, pick a school. And you were like, okay, great. I'll do it. But you were asked that question when you were probably 15, 16, maybe 17 years old. And you know what we don't have when we're 15, 16, 17 years old? Like a frontal lobe, like the part of our brain that dictates good, sound, logical decision making. So even if we did make a decision, by the time we get to be 25 or 35 or 45 or 55, we're not the same person as we were then. And even if we did for some amazing way actually know ourselves back then, the world around us has changed. When my first book came out, I used to get this question like, what advice would you give your 22 year old self? And I was like, my 22 year old self who's listening to a podcast that was recorded over the internet and I'm hearing it on my cell phone. Like none of those things existed when I was 22. So even if I did know myself, it doesn't actually matter. So I think this idea that we're chasing some goal and the order to get to that goal, all we're doing is performing a part, but not actually mm -hmm. living in the life. I just think, I think you're dead on. I think all that does is just underscore bad behavior. And I don't think that that makes us thinkers or feelers at all. It just makes us performers. Do you get this from a, like a rational thought process? What's your personal background in a sense of foundation, family, parents? Where did where did this rational 
thought process come from? Oh, I mean, (laughs) I was given my definition of success by a fourth grade teacher who told me I was really argumentative and maybe I should become a lawyer. And of course, you know, the first thing I told her was that she was wrong because, you know, I was argumentative. But uh, I still at the time was watching L.A. Law and Ally McBeal. And I just kind of created a path that got me on the way to law school, where on the very first day I looked around and I was like, what did I do? Like, I made a huge mistake. I don't belong here. I don't want to be a lawyer. I think I had parents who wanted me to take the safe choice, right? Who wanted me to. The pressure. Like, the, the pressure, parent, like the parent pressure. Absolutely. I should become a thing, right? Yeah. Like, so they can check yeah. a box and they can tell their friends, like, look at my kid. And, and so I think there was always that pressure. So they were none too happy when I dropped out of law school to join a presidential campaign of an unknown Southern governor. They, they were like, Governor who? From where? Arkansas? Like, not a chance in hell. So uh, where did the rational thinking of it come from? It came from interviewing thousands of people over those 20 years and just seeing how all these people who on paper had it all seemed to have nothing. Like they just weren't really happy. And, you know, I was doing this work for mission-driven organizations, universities, foundations, um, uh, advocacy organizations, service organizations. And I was like, well, if they've got success and they've got purpose and they're not happy, like the rest of us are screwed, right? And then I just realized that it wasn't that. Like you could have purpose if you want to make a lot of money and buy a Maserati in a beach house. Like awesome. We all define purpose differently. But I think, I don't know about you, but I was taught that success came in really sort of one brand, right? Like the Mm -hmm. fastest and most expedient path to the corner office. If it wasn't LA law, it was lean in, like whatever the thing was of that generation of kids coming up, it was a different variation of the same definition, right? It was lifestyles of the rich and famous, like whatever the thing was, that was the definition of success. And it turns out that that definition doesn't make a lot of people happy. Yeah. I mean, you think about brick and mortar, you know, I think mm-hmm. brick and mortar is sold in a certain way to society. And I, when I say brick and mortar, like these uh, brands of industry that have been around for years and years and years that it have not evolved mm-hmm. uh, on their own in a way. And they hide behind that brick and mortar in a way. And then you see that playing out. I have this thing of, you know, I'm all about foundation and I don't think you can create any value unless you build the right foundation. And what I've seen in my experience is if you're especially in entertainment, you know, I saw it in the comedy industry because I changed the way the comedy industry did business uh, in 2016 and it never been done before. I took a kid from the tra- a trailer to Just for Laughs, the Super Bowl comedy in two years with a social media model. And then I looked inside that industry and realized that the people who wanted to get in the industry were trying to appease industry and they're forgetting who's paying. And I came up with this thing called know who's paying because everybody forgot that. And I think that has, you know, industries have been very blind to who's paying the bill for I think their that's business. So, so true. I mean, like you look at something like Blockbuster, right? And you look at, you look at Netflix and Red Redbox, you know, came along and Blockbuster was so big and was really servicing the, you know, the, the distribution companies, but they weren't servicing the people. Like you had all these nasty, like, you know, you got to rewind and you get these fees and all that. And they were so big that when the tectonic plates shifted, they couldn't move fast enough. I started my search firm because I was at a big search firm that was charging one third of the first year's cash compensation to these organizations. And if you're doing a search for the, I don't know, chief strategy officer for the Kellogg Foundation, that search is going to pay $300,000 a year. So the fee is a hundred grand. If I'm doing a search for a local executive director for a domestic violence shelter, that search is going to pay 90, right? So I'm either getting a hundred thousand dollar fee or a $30,000 fee. Who do you think as a young assistant at that search firm, I'm more incentivized by my boss to pay attention to? Obviously the big fee, but who do you think needs the, the leadership more? Who do you think has a harder time finding people? It's the domestic violence shelter. And I just felt like I'm not serving the people I'm supposed to be serving. Like the problem that I'm sitting here trying to solve is my boss's need to have a big fat bottom line when I should be trying to solve the problem of helping these people find the best talent to solve the problem. And so I did the same thing. I didn't call it, you know, I didn't call it what you called it, but it's the same idea, which is I had to think about what problem I was trying to solve 
health. And, and, and I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's never been a time where access to people is more like little d democratized, right? So if somebody can make their way to just for laughs using social media, I mean, the, these sort of legacy brands, these brick and mortars, they need to change what they're doing and they need to change how they define success in house because it's just not going to work anymore. There are old ways they just don't work. It's funny you say that because at the time when this happened, and it had never been done before because it takes comedians 10, it's mostly comedians 10 to 15 years to get to Just for Laughs. And when we did it, we did it in 2018. I, we were with ICM, and ICM just bought the festival. We partnered with Howie Mandel, and the industry was pissed. So they tried to create uh, this narrative about my comedian that was completely untrue, caused oh, wow. an inter international incident, and came after me. The whole industry came after us outside of outside of ICM, you know, the agents and everything like that. But based on how I built my universe and built the foundation, because we had, you know, insulary fans, they couldn't do anything to us. So we it actually made us bigger than we were. But because I built the foundation the right way, that proved that that value could stand up against anything. And mm -hmm. two people to threaten a whole genre of entertainment in Hollywood, I think, is a big deal. Everybody knows this, but they will not acknowledge it till today. You know what I mean? It's like, there's John. I hate I can't, that's some of a bitch. She keeps winning, but you know, that this is, it's a weird dichotomy, I guess. I mean, I know you're supposed to be interviewing me, but I'm so curious about all of that. I mean, when did you have, did you have other comedians that were like, do for me what you did for him? Like, did you have people coming at you or were they like, were the comedians themselves nervous because they didn't want to piss off the brick and mortars? No, actually I worked with some pretty big names. Well, I don't want to say who, some pretty big names. There's some pretty big mainstream that had been in industry for a while and because there's such a traditional process when I got you know involved with some of these people who've been in the business for a while they didn't really want to do the work mm -hmm. that I wanted them to do because they didn't get it mm -hmm. I said you have to really unearth everything here mm -hmm. so let's let's kind of restart this let's start building the right fans because when you relate that to what I realized in industry and in, in talking about your numbers of a hundred thousand ninety thousand you know anticipation of the workplace and you think about conversion right when you these industries set up this ideology that if you meet going back to the test if you meet this criteria you're going to make three hundred thousand dollars a year right so anticipation of the workplace they hire a business hires that person they're paying them three hundred thousand dollars a year and there's no value to the company mm -hmm. you, you know what i mean so it's all kind of goes hand in hand in a way, right? I mean, if that makes sense. I mean, what do you think about about that, about anticipation of the workplace because of the narrative that has been sold to us as as a society? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think anticipation of of unrealistic uh un, I think unrealistic expectations is the root of a lot of misery in our world. You know, they I I I have I have recently uh been let down by somebody who was very close to me and I, I had to spend some time thinking about whether or not I was the problem or she was the problem. And maybe both of us were the problem, right? Maybe she shouldn't have let me down. Maybe she shouldn't have been a flake, but maybe I also shouldn't have expected what I expected, right? This sort of, so I think whether it's the workplace or in our personal relationships, I think we often have these outsized expectations of what's going to be. And it's sort of not really based on much at all. One of the things I write about in Wonder Hell is this idea of perfectionism. And I, I interviewed somebody who said like when they were younger, they were, they were painting uh, album covers in the back of jean jackets. And anytime they would finish an album cover on the jean jacket, and it didn't look exactly like the image in their head, which by the way, they had no right to expect because they'd only been painting for like a hot minute. They didn't have the skill set yet. They would destroy it. And it, they would just like, it would, it would be one of those sort of like self punishing acts of, 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 of destruction of their art. And you know, what he said to me was that it all came down to this outsized expectation of what we should have based on the work that we've put in up until that point. You know, there's a great, there's a great line, like, you know, don't complain about the results you, you're not getting from the work you're not doing. <laughs> I sort of feel like that's kind of did the your, same did thing. Did your friend, did your friend not like the truth? Is that what it was? Uh, I think he didn't like the truth, which was at the time that he wasn't a very talented painter. This was, you know, he was in his early twenties. He was young. He was, you know, not mature. Now he's 
approaching 60 and he's like, the coolest thing right now is that every time I see somebody who's doing something that I can't do, I think to myself, isn't it amazing that I get to spend the rest of my life working towards that? So some of it's just maturity, right? Some of it's just maturity and growth, mm-hmm. but I did, it, it, you know, it's, it's all to say that, that, that the, the chasm between expectation and reality is often where a lot of our grief lies. Have you ever looked into how your subconscious is programmed and, you know, based on your subconscious being programmed, create your unconscious bias decisions, which limits us from consciousness. Is that something you've ever looked into? I mean, I've sort of, you know, read a little bit around the edges, but I'd love for you to say more. When you think about subconscious, we, as a kid, going back to a kid and and thinking about your narrative, you know, if you could get this into somehow the young minds, you know, that are coming up and help program their subconscious because what happens is your subconscious becomes programmed which create a, creates a pattern right so then when you start going through some of these experiences your unconscious bias comes out which mm-hmm. is you know the emotions and your emotions are the juggernaut of the universe and we never really get the consciousness because of that and it goes to what you're saying you know they didn't build the foundation the right way that subconscious programming was not building helping these kids build these foundations foundations. Yeah. I think that goes hand in hand as well. That's another thing. I, I talked to a lot of these big thinkers and like uh, Dr. Bradley Nelson and uh, Joe Vitale, you know, spiritual, this, you know, how the spiritual side and the human experience and, and what you're dealing with, with tech and everything, how it coincides, you know, and I think if people understand all that is linear in a way, they could probably solve some problems quicker. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's, <laughs> I have a, 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 a another fellow author uh, that I talk with every Tuesday morning, uh, and it, she's sort of my work wife, uh, Rahaf Harfouche, and she's super smart about basically everything. I just think she's she one of like the neatest humans ever. And I was talking to her about a problem that I was having a few weeks ago, and she was like, are you trying to solve this problem or is the injured 11 year old in you still trying to solve this problem. And I was like, Oh, you're right. Right. Like I was having this, this moment where I was feeling, uh, like a little sting of rejection. And she was like, yeah, I remember that story you told me about when you were 11. You told me that story like a year ago. She's like, it sounds like the 11 year old in you was still trying to solve this problem. I was like, yeah, it's true. Like I have not, I have not matured past that 11 year old rejection moment in a lot of ways. And when that a rejection comes, up and you know I, I'm I'm an author and a speaker I'm I am a, I'm in a rejection filled world right I'm uh-huh. like just waiting for the crappy reviews um, it really it's it's not the 52 year old me who's absorbing the rejection in part it's probably the 11 year old it's probably that part of me that's still in my subconscious you're probably right about that if you're a young person from your perspective how would you approach your narrative how would you approach your narrative to be successful if I was a young person considering my own narrative yeah, as first, a young person? You, yeah, you know, you're going into your first gig or whatever it is, and you're going with your heart. How will you be successful if you're going with your heart and what's so, passionate to you? Yeah. So when I was in recruiting, I used to listen for like eight motivating factors that would interest anybody at any time into a new job. So if I were calling somebody and I wanted to recruit them away, I would listen for things like, are they inspired by the mission? Are they excited by the leadership? How prestigious are they thinking this job's going to look on their resume? How many skills are they going to learn? How broad is the impact? Um, how deep is the challenge, right? There's specific things that I'm listening for. And of course, money, right? How much money am I going to make? And the problem is that when we're given this list by a counselor, it's just a list. And society tells us like, put money, number one, like money Money, like how much are you making? That's the most important thing. But I did a I did an assessment, a three year assessment from January 2019 all the way through like before, during, and as we came out of the pandemic. And I have six thousand responses from seventy four different countries, so I can tell you with no uncertain terms that only thirty eight percent of people say that money is the number one factor that contributes to their work happiness. Which means that for over sixty percent of us, it's something else. And so I guess if I were talking to a young person right now, I would say take that list. It's a great list, but prioritize it in the way that is meaningful to you, number one. And number two, know that probably every five to seven years, 
the prioritization of that list is going to change. You know, every five to seven years, maybe you're married, maybe you've got kids, maybe your kids have grown out of the house, maybe you're dealing with aging parents, maybe there's a global pandemic, right? It could be anything. I think we go into life thinking like, here's the list and that's the list forever. And it's the list that somebody else from the outside gives us, but like what actually matters to us? And so I think that's the first thing. And then the second thing is I would say, if you're thinking about your narrative, you should also be thinking about what's coming in externally. So the narrative should be an internal narrative, but a lot of us get an external narrative and it gets placed on top of us. And we're just like, okay, I guess I'll wear that t-shirt. I don't really mm -hmm. like green, but green's going to be my color from now on. Cause that's the first t-shirt I got. And then we live in a green shirt forever. So I would ask like, who is around you and who's handing you your narrative? And are those all the people that should be handing you your narrative? Cause we give a lot of votes in our lives to people who shouldn't even have voices. And a lot of that is because they're just the ones who have historically had votes in our lives, but mm -hmm. maybe we need to be more intentional about whose opinions we're taking and whose opinions we're not. How about like fear? You know, kids have a lot of fear today. You know, what kids, do you think about yeah. fear? Yeah, I would say that. I mean, John, like think about think about the stories you love to tell at cocktail parties. Like, are those the stories of your greatest successes or are they the stories that like of the moments where you totally face planted and you failed ridiculously? Mm -hmm. But you learned and you grew and you innovated and you iterated and you you got better. I know at this age that I've survived all my bad days. I've survived my worst days. I've made it through all of them. But when you're 20, you're 22, you're 25, you're 20, it's just terrifying. And you think every single failure is going to be, it's going to be your identity forever. And it's mm -hmm. really not. I mean, the, the best quote I ever read was Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, um, we'd worry much less about what people thought about us if we realized how seldomly they did. Mm -hmm. It turns out nobody cares. Nobody's paying attention. Yeah. You know, one of my coaching clients I was just talking to uh, right before I got uh, on the podcast with you was like, I haven't sent out my newsletter in two weeks. I'm going to send one out today. Should I tell everybody why I've been quiet? And I'm like, no, nobody's been sitting around wondering, I wonder when I'm going to get that next newsletter. Like nobody cares. Nobody's noticing. And so, yeah, I mean, it's scary, but most of our fear is based in uncertainty and doubt and this anxiety and worry that somebody's going to see us and realize that we're an imposter and that we don't belong and we don't know what we're doing. But it turns out none of us know what we're doing. We're just making it up as we go along. You know, well, do you think there's two parts there I think about you know, when you when you think about kids worrying about judgment, so if you're out there listening and you think you're being judged, think about what you're thinking about. Are you really worrying about the people around you? You're probably exactly. worrying about yourself. More. And you're so busy worrying about yourself, you don't have time to worry about them. And they're probably so busy worrying about themselves. They love yeah. to worry about you. There's actually a great um, there's a great uh, theory in psych. I know you have two points, but just on the first one, there's a, there's a great theory in psychology uh, that's called pluralistic ignorance. And it's all about imposter syndrome, right? So like, if I feel like I'm an imposter and I don't feel like I belong, I'm going to walk in and I'm going to swell up my arms. I'm going to puff out my chest and I'm going to pretend like I belong there. And you've got imposter syndrome and you're like, oh no, Laura seems like she knows what she's doing. I better swell up my arms and puff up my chest. So I look like I know what I'm doing. And then I'm like, oh no, John looks like he knows what he's doing. I better puff up my arms and swell up my chest even more. Right. And yeah. all of a sudden we're in this like arms race where neither one of us can admit that neither one of us know what the hell we're doing. And instead we're stuck in this place where we're both ignorant about how the other's actually feeling. And so I think if we just understand that you know, everyone else is so worried about what we think of them. <laughs> They're not thinking about us at all. And we can just be yeah. ourselves and it's going to be okay. Well, the other thing goes back to, you know, programming that subconscious is think about how kids are, are trained. Instead of saying like, when you we approach something you've never done before, it's like, can I do this? Will I be successful? How do I do this? Instead of being trained, I can do this. I will be successful, you know, and, and having a different side, that positive Sad, because I think sometimes we perpetuate negativity and that carries out yeah. through, you know, yes. the whole yes. process of life. Absolutely. This is one of the things that I, I said in the, uh, we were talking about my, my TED talk that just hit a million views before we started recording. And one of the things I said is that, you know, every time we approach something we haven't done before, we have this voice inside of our head, like these governors and old cars that, um, that were put in the engine so that you couldn't put the pedal all the way to the metal and go like 200 miles an hour. Like the car can go 200 miles an hour, but there's a governor in the engine that literally stops the gas.
gas from being able to pump in enough um, to make it work. I think that's how it works. I'm sure like some car heads out there are going to be like, that's not how it works. But the idea is that the governor stops us from being only able to go 120 miles an hour. So we don't literally like drive off the side of the road or burn ourselves out. And I think we have the same governor inside our head that every time we're like on the edge of doing something we haven't done before, it goes, oh my God, you haven't done this before. And you hear that in your head, like, oh my God, I haven't done this before. And really we hear that as a limitation. But if we switch the way we're hearing that, like you said, to something positive, oh my God, I haven't done this before. Suddenly it's an invitation to what else we Mm -hmm. can do, which I think changes everything. So this idea of, you know, can I do it? Can't I do it? Just seeing it as an opportunity to Mm -hmm. figure it out, to grow, to know that this is, yeah, it's something new, but that's like for students, right, who get red ink all over the paper when they hand in a test, like the red ink is where the magic happens. It feels kind of painful, right? But that's that's where you grow. I think you have a great way of communicating to the masses because I have a hard time. I have a hard time doing that. A lot of times people, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, You're the you, you podcast, man. <laughs> <laughs> They're like either he's crazy or he's very smart. To be able to translate what you're what you're saying to make people understand it is a big deal, I think. Because I have a lot of people, like I said, look at me like I got three heads sometimes when I talk to them about certain things. So, I mean, and this is the book here, right? Yes, that's the book. That's Wonder the book how. Here. So, what is your ultimate passion that you want to get? out of this book and readers to know about your narrative and and life and so forth? Uh, If I have any superpower, and I think I have one, that's it. I've got one superpower. It's that I think I can look at people and in pretty short order, see what makes them great and actually reflect it back on them in ways where they can finally see it or actually finally act upon it. And so in Wonder Hell, what I really want to do is help people who have achieved a little bit of something. They could have sold their first business. They could have sold their first, you know, tube of lipstick. Like they've just, they've, they have started to feel a little bit of success and they've realized that they're actually made for more. But in that moment where they peek through the doors of like what they never thought was available, they see even more doors that they never thought were available for them. And I want people to understand that it's in that moment where we're like, it's exciting, it's amazing, it's humbling, it's wonderful. But also I'm really scared. I have that fear. I have that doubt. I have that uncertainty. It's wonderful, but it's also kind of hell because I feel this potential now. I see this possible me and I feel this potential, this burden of potential that's sitting on my shoulders. And it's like, hey, John, what you got for me, right? What are you going to do with this newfound potential? And what I really want to do in Wonder Hell is I want to tell people that that little bit of success success you had where you thought it was like, once I achieve that, it's going to be awesome. Downhill, easy money, you know, wind at my back. It's actually just when things get harder because success isn't an end point. It's a waypoint, right? It's the Mm -hmm. portal that shows you everything else you can do and everything else that you're made of. And I want people to feel all these voices in their head, whether they're the narratives that we talked about or these external people that are outside of you trying to tell you to like be in a box or whatever it is, that these are not limitations, they're invitations to all that you can become. Because we have this idea that when I feel stress or I feel uncertainty or I'm anxious, I should just like shoulder to the grind, you know, to, to, to the wheel, like nose to the grindstone, and I should just survive it. And I think we need to figure out how to thrive in it instead, because on the other side of this wonder hell, it's just your next success, right? So it's like Mm -hmm. the next wonder hell and the next one and the next one after that. So we need to learn not to survive these moments, but to actually thrive in them and enjoy the ride. I look at corporations and I look at going back to brick and mortar businesses. I think they're 35 years behind the curve. How do we unearth these businesses? I think it's about the businesses understanding. Well, first of all, I think businesses need to understand that the people who walked out of their business in 2019 are not the same people who are walking back in in 2021, 2022, 2023. Even if they look exactly the same, we've all changed. We're different. Mm-hmm. Like there's just a collective transformation that happened. For some of it, it's a, it's it's an evolution. For some 
some of it, it's a devolution, but we've all changed. And I think for businesses to understand that part of, listen, part of why Wonder Health feels so difficult is because when we evolve into a new version of ourselves, there's all these other people around us and they're not all on the same trajectory as us. Some of them are moving faster. A lot of them are moving slower. And some of them aren't so comfortable with our rise because they liked us smaller, right? They liked us smaller mm -hmm. because they care about us and they want to see us get hurt. Or maybe they're smaller and they're jealous. So they're a little worried about your rise because all they see is their own stagnation. Maybe they're just scared and they're like, you can't do that. That's too scary. What they really mean is I can't do that. I'm too scared. And I think that um, the people who are walking back into these businesses have seen themselves in this sort of more holistic way. And I think that businesses, managers, leaders need to be looking at the people who have walked back in and think about not just their wonder hell about work, but like their wonder hell about every single part of their lives. And so, you know, if you're a leader um, in a business thinking about people, I think you got to think about their wonder hell that way. If you're just like a business business, I think it's thinking about like what other opportunities the world has now that it didn't have before. Right. So like mm -hmm. yours, a perfect example, like the comedy industry could take what you did and look at that and say, that's pretty cool. There's nothing but runway there. How do mm -hmm. we do that for ourselves? Like if you could do that with a comedian and social media, imagine if you controlled all these media outlets. Imagine if you had connections to every famous comedian out there who could just like post about someone on your story. Like there's so much that they can do, but it's scary, right? It's scary. It's hard. It's much more comfortable to just sort of sit in what they know, succeed where they've succeeded and be like, well, this is hard. It's much harder to live into the wonder because then there's possibility of failure that just doesn't feel very comfortable. And if you're a business and you're successful and you've been doing something forever, you can keep doing what you're doing 35 years ago. But eventually Netflix is going to come up and eat your lunch. When you think about, you know, a Netflix or whoever it is and or producers, you think about producing and it's, it's weird how I learned a lot in entertainment was able, able to look at business and see how that relates. And you, you think about how people communicate and whether it's you're communicating with content, however it is. When I approached my way of producing this comedian and you look at things that are relatable, entertaining and educational, this is the three things that I look at when you communicate with content. It's got to be relatable, entertaining and educational. I, this is going to be the new wave. And I think the new wave of social media is creating a position of influence. And I have a process that I think will eliminate uh, marketing completely because you can go a database way and pin people against the wall with everything they need to know. But if you're producing somebody or you're producing a TV show and you have somebody that's been in TV for 25 years, uh, that talent comes in and they start rewriting their lines. And what I found is they start diluting that authenticity. So the communication is not as relatable that it should be from that authentic artist. So when I approached it, I said, all right, this guy has some very relatable content in, in how he's conveying his message. I said, all right, I'm going to create an outline. I'm going to help him with his timing and just let him fill the holes. And I think that, you know, it, it takes a great talent to do what I do, but I think not having that dilution and whatever it is, whether it's a manager in a business, whether it's a producer of a TV show, I think we got to understand that people are driven by identity in today's time and you have to let people be authentic, you know, and that kind of speaks to your narrative as well. And I, I experienced that firsthand, you know, create the outline, give them a platform, you know, if there are a great talent and see what happens and see how more relatable that could be to, you know, the people. For Sure. I mean, there is there is nothing worse than writing by committee, right? So like yeah. if you've written a little bit, somebody else has written a little bit, somebody else has written a bit, and then the talent starts writing a little bit, then you have a spork, right? Like it's just, yeah. it's, it's not a spoon, it's not a fork, it's the worst of both options. It's funny because when I first started off in this work, I thought I had to put online like a just absolutely polished, I got my act together, I know what I'm doing, I never make a mistake. And the more I got comfortable with who I am and confident with who I am, the more I just put up like the full real me. And that gets so much more attention. Um, actually, when uh, my my birthday was about three weeks ago and I posted a video of me like sitting on my desk with this 
enormous sheet cake in front of me. And I love sheet cake, like the grosser the supermarket sheet cake, the better, right? Like I love sheet cake. And it was just me and the cake and a fork. And I was shoveling the thing into my face as I'm like, and I got to tell you, today's my birthday and it's the best day you can pre-order Wonder Hell. And there are all these bonuses that you can get. And oh my God, yay for me. And it was like Tina Fey style, just like shoveling the cake into my face. And I got so many comments and likes and reshares of that. It was like this huge thing. And I had this one guy who called me up and he's like, I don't know, Laura, that's really not on brand. I mean, you're like sitting on your <laughs> desk wearing a pair of overalls and you're shoveling she kick into your face. And John, there's never been anything more on brand for me than that. Like that's who I am. And the people who have been following me and watching me for the last, you know, three, five years, they know that as me. So the very next week of my newsletter, I sent out a newsletter saying, so I got this call from a friend who had my best interest at heart, but he didn't know my heart. Like he, he's a business professor. He only sees my businessy stuff. Like he doesn't see my full stuff. And I got so many reply. I was just like, I, I'm like, what do you think? I'm like, I think that was pretty on brand. Like, I think that we should figure out who's given us advice and who's given us criticism and whose we should take and who we really are and like live in the world as that person. And I got, I don't know, maybe in the first hour, like 50 responses from that email, like, hell yeah, like, let's all eat the cake. Let's be authentic. And I just think not only does authenticity resonate, being righteously indignant about being authentic resonates too. You mentioned something there that your guy said about reaction. Acting mm -hmm. to responses. Mm -hmm. So in my process, when you think about emotion, you've built the right foundation, you're communicating with the right tone, you're using the right timing to communicate that tone. When it gets to emotion, this is what people don't, this is what I, it's so weird to me that people don't understand. You know, in life, if you understand emotion is the biggest, and I said this earlier, is the biggest juggernaut in the universe. When you have emotions involved, that's when your worst decisions are made. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and this is what I tell my people, because we, we're a meta, we're a meta media partner. And I'm a, one of 30 companies that's a partner with Facebook. And I never knew I had intelligence in tech till I started talking to tech people. But, you know, a lot of these businesses, just speaking to what your guy said, is when these people start res responding, right, and they go crazy or whatever, they have these knee-jerk reactions. And they want to change this. They want to change that. They want to change that. If you didn't build your foundation, you probably need to change some stuff. But if you built your foundation the right way, you don't need to have any knee-jerk reactions, mm -hmm. take that information, digest it, and use that as your micro fixes. You don't want to have a big swing yeah. off emotions because those those are the bad decisions. You know, mm -hmm. they really are. I don't know wonder why people don't understand that part. Yeah. You know, my old business partner was all brain. She was, you know, PhD. She was so smart. And I'm all gut. I'm like born in Brooklyn, raised in Miami. Like I went to college. I have a master's degree, but I smoked my way, smoked pot all the way through. I don't remember anything. Like I, I mean, you know, I memorized a lot of stuff as we talked yeah. about at the beginning of this podcast. I didn't learn Jack. Yeah. So when we were partners, every time we had to make a decision about something, I would come in with like gut reaction and she would come in with like mental focus and, you know, the framework. And every once in a while, when she would get all emotional and I would get all mental, we were like, okay, something's wrong. Like the kilter, like the, like the gravity of the universe, like something is wrong. And so I was very good at like, here's my gut reaction. And now here's the yards of data, right. That are going to back it up. And she was very good at the, like, here's the data. How does this feel in my gut? But when we flipped that and we were out of the way that we normally make decisions, we made bad decisions. We made mm -hmm. bad decisions. And it wasn't until a few years into it that when she would come to me with some like emotional thing, I was like, wait a minute, there's a problem that's not the problem. There's like, there's a foundational problem that we need to talk about first before we can talk about this problem because there's something that's offsetting the kilter of the universe. So we're not going to make a good decision about this problem until we fix the sub problem. Well, I mean, if people understood if they could isolate unconscious bias or eliminate it in a process, things would be more consistent. Well, sure. Would I mean, we'd also get rid of racism. We'd get rid of, <laughs> we'd get rid of a lot of problems in the world if we can get rid of subconscious bias. Absolutely. The problem is everybody that everyone has subconscious bias except for them. I'm trying to unearth the world, but it's a heavy task. But, you know, I'll keep talking. <laughs> I mean, you know, listen, you, you, you got the, you, you know, the, the step number one is being a partner with the biggest media company in the world. Right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a redneck from North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, and also you're like producing comedy. I mean, I, I learn, I learned so much. I mean, like, just think about comedy, like look at 
Chris Rock's new special. Look at Dave Chappelle. Look at some of these comedians who are out there and like, they're funny, but it's social commentary for sure. One of my favorite comedians is James Acaster. And he is so good at sort of telling a story and unraveling a bit and making a callback. And, you know, repertoire is absolutely brilliant. But there's a lot of social commentary in there about how we treat each other and how we treat people and 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 what do we do with people when they're at their most vulnerable. So, you know, what do they say? Like, if you want to change people, make them laugh, right? If you want yeah. people to listen, you make them laugh. Yeah. Well, Chris Rock had a lot of uh, subliminal messages in his last special was, was very yeah. interesting. He had a lot of subliminal messages and he had a lot of not subliminal messages. <laughs> Then he, hit you, then he hit you in the face, too. Then he hit you in the face, yeah. I mean, but, you know, as a speaker, I watch a lot of comedians. A lot. I mean, I've learned more about keynote speaking from stand-up comics than I have from keynote speaking coaches. I mean, there's just so much in there about storytelling and audience reaction and evoking emotion and callbacks and 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 just committing to the bit. It's, it's people always ask me, like, how do you get – how do you get comfortable speaking on stage? And I'm like, I get comfortable not speaking on mm -hmm. stage, right? And comedians are so good at that of like telling a joke and letting it land and then mm -hmm. walking across the stage and doing a callback. And then 10 minutes later, I mean, it's, it is, it is such great education for anybody who needs to present anything to anyone. I think we had some, some very good information in this podcast. Love your narrative and, and love your direction. And, 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 you know, everybody go out. And get the book, Wonder Hell, Alara Gasner Otting. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you would like to talk about or speak about, but I appreciate you coming on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here. I guess I would just say my name is Laura Gassner Otting. All my good friends call me LGO. So people can find me anywhere on the socials at Hey LGO. And yeah, Wonder Hell is available right now. It comes out on April 4th, but it's available for pre order at wonderhell.com. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, fun, free goodies and bonuses with pre-orders. Well, great conversation. I appreciate it. This has been uh, Laura Gassner-Odding, and I'm John Edmund Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Mm -hmm.